In this video, we're talking about men who are looking to add hormone therapy as a possible treatment for their Gleason 8 prostate cancer that is localized to the prostate and has not metastasized throughout the body. They've gotten PSMA scans and now they want to know what their options are and what the process of hormone therapy would look like in this situation. So today I'm interviewing Dr. Mark Schultz, who's a 30-year medical oncologist focusing solely on prostate cancer, and he's going to talk about the ins and outs with us. So in today's video, Dr. Scholz, we're talking about hormone therapy for high-risk patients. You know, we have other videos where we talk about, you know, Gleason 6 and how we don't need treatment and it's active surveillance. And then we talked about the differences between 3 plus 4 and 4 plus 3 when it comes to Gleason 7. But when we think of high risk, we think about it as Gleason 8 and above, which is a completely different matter, especially for newly diagnosed patients. So can you kind of describe Gleason 8 prostate cancer and why we call it high risk? All right. Before we had PSMA PET scans, the art of prostate cancer was to look at the Gleason score, the number of cores positive, how high the PSA is, how large the tumor is on MRI, and calculate the likelihood of micrometastatic disease outside the prostate. And this was necessary because the CAT scans and bone scans were so crude, you needed a, a chunk of cancer a half inch across before you could detect metastatic disease. It was learned through experience that if you uh, took men with Gleason 8, 9, 10, it, or PSA over 20, or a really large tumor that you could feel with your finger, and gave them hormone treatment in addition to their radiation treatment that they had better outcomes, higher cure rates, and uh, better survival rates five, 10 years down the line. That type of uh, methodology was worked out in a number of clinical trials, and it continues to be considered the standard of care as of 2024. What's changed, and the reason for us to discuss this today is the uh, precision that we can get with PSMA PET scans allow us, us to determine more accurately if any spread has already occurred. So high risk, uh, the possibility of micrometastatic disease uh, it may need to be redefined when men have a PET scan showing no metastasis. And uh, it's probably beyond high risk when you have a PET scan that confirms metastasis. Incorporating this new PSMA information that comes from these fantastic scans is a very logical consideration now for these men with what are traditionally been called high-risk factors. Before I get to my next question, please click that subscribe button. When you do this, it tells the YouTube algorithm that this video helped you, and they'll push out our videos to other people who are looking for answers. Also, if you would like to join our cause, you can do so at pcri.org forward slash donate. It's a great way to support us. Now back to my conversation with Dr. Scholz. So when it comes to men who have high risk and maybe it's localized to the prostate, do you put men who have localized grade, Gleason grade eight disease on hormone therapy? Yes, we do. Perhaps we temper the, the uh, duration of the treatment. Historically high risk without PSMA PET scans uh, was treated with 18 to 24 months of testosterone deprivation. Lupron, Eligard, Trelstar, Firmagon, Orgovix, and this was given in conjunction with some sort of radiation to the prostate and oftentimes prophylactic radiation to the surrounding lymph nodes as well. In men that have a high-risk pattern but show a PSMA PET scan with no metastasis, we have discussions about foreshortening the hormone treatment perhaps down to six to eight to nine months because we think that uh, since nothing is visible on the PSMA PET scan, early indications from clinical trials is that there's only about a 20% chance that there's microscopic disease out there. And uh, one could argue that 80% of the time these men would get by with no hormone treatment at all and they would be cured. But of course we have to consider the implications that for the 20% and we suspect that adding hormone treatment, some form of hormone treatment, eight to nine months versus 18 months, will uh, improve cure rates in these people with negative PSMA PET scans by perhaps 5 to 10 percent. It's uh, still a consideration to use hormone therapy, but we're having discussions about not continuing it as long as we've historically continued it um, 18 to 24 months in the men with, uh, that have clear PET scans showing no spread outside the gland. So for patients who do have localized grade 8, you know, prostate cancer, Gleason grade 8, and they are you know, wondering if they can shorten their time when it comes to hormone therapy. Does the volume of disease matter? Does the location of the disease matter? Location inside the prostate doesn't have a lot of uh, implications. Uh, there is a connection between uh, 
teeny tiny tumors not metastasizing and much larger tumors metastasizing. And I think that is somewhat of a consideration. Something else has to be factored into this whole decision-making process, and that is that the development of a metastatic lesion down the line, so let's say a man goes through radiation to his prostate, has hormone treatment um, for six to eight months, and then gets monitored over the ensuing years, maybe 10, 15% of these men will have a relapse someday. But the relapses that we're seeing now with PSMA PET scans are different than the relapses that we were seeing prior to PSMA PET scans. In the old days, if the PSA started rising, we knew that quite possibly we wouldn't be able to find the location of the uh, lesion until maybe the PSA is two, three, or four with maximum PET scans, whereas now we can find the location of these lesions when the PSA is less than one. So what that means is that the mop-up for the small percentage of men that do relapse someday is gonna be more effective, and some of those relapse patients can be cured with spot radiation to an early metastatic site. So since we have a little bit more of a safety net, I think it also argues for uh, considering shorter hormone treatment not the full 18 to 24 months, which is a very onerous, heavy-handed treatment, uh, especially when uh, medicines like Lupron are used, because 18 to 24 months of testosterone deprivation often translates into 24 to 36 months of low testosterone, as these elderly men don't recover testosterone very quickly. So since we're talking about PSMA and this, it's revolutionary technology and it came out and was approved in 2021 and now we're seeing it used in prostate cancer. For a man who's newly diagnosed with Gleason grade eight, you know, is this a covered scan that they can get? Is it widely available? How do they get access to it? And Medicare started covering it uh, in anyone with a diagnosis of prostate cancer at any stage in early 2022. The private insurances were pushing back and calling it investigational through a lot of 2022, but at some time in early 2023, we saw that change. And for the most part, the coverage of PSMA PET scan for staging newly diagnosed prostate cancer has been uh, covered by the insurance companies. For men who are, you know, talking about taking these types of hormone therapies, there's a distinction between first generation hormone therapies and second generation hormone therapies. Can you describe the difference? Yeah, I think it's important to raise that that point, uh, because earlier in this video, we were talking about maybe foreshortening the duration of hormone treatment. A lot of the anti-cancer benefits, I think, occur early on in the course of hormone treatment, and then, of course, the side effects tend to get a little cumulative as you go longer and longer. Adding a second-generation agent, such as Zytiga, Erlita, Nubeca, or Xtandi, to a first-generation agent like Lupron, uh, Firmagon, Orgovix, uh, Eligard, uh, is very logical, but not considered mainstream or standard of care. The reason I say it's logical is because these second generation agents certainly add horsepower to the anti-cancer effect, but generally speaking, they don't add a lot of side effects. The side effects of the first generation uh, agents is certainly significant, but adding a second generation agent on top of it doesn't add a lot more side effects. It does, however, add anti-cancer efficacy. There is an, an improvement in cancer killing with the use of these second generation agents. So while all the studies that have been done uh, adding hormone treatment to radiation and showing better outcomes in men with high-risk disease were done only with first generation agents, I tend to discuss adding a second generation agent to patients who are going to be doing hormone therapy just because there isn't too much downside and there is a potential upside in terms of its anti-cancer effects. So with hormone therapy, there are a, you know, different side effects that come along with it. And one of the things we've encouraged our PCRI audience is to know the side effects ahead of time and try to create a side effect mitigation plan with their you know, medical teams in order to kind of know ahead of time, have those things in place and deal with them and not suffer in silence because a lot of men deal with these silently and never even bring it up. So can you list out the side effects that are associated with hormone therapy, and then some of the things that they can do to help eliminate or alleviate some of those issues. There is a rather extensive list, but I would say in the decision-making process about whether you wanna be on these types of agents and if you're going to extend it for shorter or longer treatment periods, there are three things to be aware of. One, and the most, I think, most important one is potential loss of muscle mass, which uh, occurs pretty quickly when you block testosterone. And this leads to notable fatigue, weakness, um, 
and sometimes even mild depression. The good news is that it can be counteracted very significantly with resistance training, that means weight training. And uh, that should be considered a non-negotiable component of hormone treatment. Every man who embarks upon testosterone deprivation should be on a weight training program, going to the gym three days a week, preferably under the supervision of a trainer. The other two issues that are very prominent, one, there isn't a whole lot you can do about it. It's just the loss of interest in romantic and sexual activity. Men can still function sexually with these magical Cialis and Viagra pills, but they are not motivated, They're just not attracted to the idea of sexuality. This generally goes away pretty completely when the treatment is stopped. The third thing is the potential for weight gain. One's metabolism slows down, and if you just stay on the same diet that you're always on, you're going to start getting a tummy. And that can become very significant. And this is what is, I think, the root cause of when they talk about increased risks of heart problems. I don't think that the treatment itself has a direct cause and effect on heart disease. But putting on 20 pounds, running higher blood sugars, having your blood pressure go up definitely enhances the risk of heart disease, and that needs to be controlled with uh, careful dieting. So is the weight gain also associated with, you know, breast enlargement and gynecomastia and first-generation hormone therapies? It can be. So there's, there's other, I will call them more minor side effects like hot flashes, loss of calcium from your bones, osteoporosis, breast enlargement. And uh, I know those all sound absolutely dreadful, but it turns out there are effective pharmacologic workarounds. You can take a pill and prevent breast enlargement. You can take a pill and prevent calcium loss from the bones. So I won't emphasize that too much in the decision-making process as long as you're being supervised by competent doctors. Uh, those issues are pretty easy to handle. There's always a big question about PSA monitoring. You know, how is the PSA going to act with hormone therapy and what do they need to see the PSA do in order to either discontinue treatment or continue treatment? Talking about men in this high-risk category, some of which are in the category because their PSA was over 20 when they um, were diagnosed. We're referring to the men that have these PSAs over 20, but even so, their PET scans don't show any metastasis. One very important uh, issue in monitoring these people is to ensure that their PSA drops down to less than 0.1 within six months of starting the hormone treatment. Failure to get to that threshold within six months uh, bespeaks of a uh, more stubborn and potentially dangerous type of prostate cancer. We don't see it very often, but it can happen. And this is something to be aware of, that PSAs that are, well, maybe they come down to 0.4. Everyone's very excited on how much the PSA was 25, now it's 0.4. Isn't that wonderful? The answer is, it's not as wonderful as getting to 0.1 because PSA is so precise at these low levels. The detection of some PSA activity above 0.1, while you're on, at least a first-generation hormonal agent, possibly a second-generation hormonal agent, maybe you've already had radiation too. And the detectable PSA is telling us that there's some resistant cancer that can survive this onslaught of treatment that you've already administered. And there's a need to go perhaps get another PET scan, try and find out if something was missed, uh, and certainly talk about further treatment is not the type of patient that I would be doing a shorter course of hormone treatment in. If they're PSA nadir, that's the official terminology for this, the PSA nadir, the lowest PSA that you attain on treatment is above 0.1. For the men that are going on this, you know, shorter course of treatment and they come off the treatment, how long does it take before things start to come back to normal and they start to maybe get their testosterone back, maybe their interest in sexual activity and things like that? Well, it's dependent on two things, the type of medicines that you used when you were treating them and also the age of the patient. So if you take an average 65-year-old man that has eight or nine months of Lupron alone, recovery time to get testosterone back will probably be in the range of four or five months. And men that are older, that'll be longer. Uh, men that are younger, it'll be shorter. You bring up an interesting point about age because I've heard in the comments and pe different people have asked me, if I'm in the 45 to 55 year old range but I have localized prostate cancer, there is no metastasis, it's grade eight, am I still able to do the shorter course or is it more dangerous for me because I'm younger? No, there hasn't been a tight connection between how cancer behaves and the age of the patient. The reason we think about age 
partly is recovery, like we already mentioned, but it's more an issue of how many years of life are we trying to preserve. So if someone's 75 years old and we can keep them alive till they're 93, they'll be very happy. Uh, someone who's 45 years old and we want to keep them alive till 93, we're, we're playing for much higher stakes. It's another 40 years of life. The 75 year old, if you tell him I can improve your cure rates by going for a full 24 months by a, maybe 3% rather than going for nine months, the 75 year old may look shocked and say, well, why would I even consider such an extended course of hormone treatment? But for a younger man, he's got 40 years of life at stake and you can improve his cure rates by three or 4%. That may be a more attractive proposition. With the side effects that we're talking about, you know, is it going to happen automatically to everybody? Do some men do better than others? There's quite a bit of variability, but the biggest factor uh, we've already addressed, the men that are compromising their exercise program, a good 80% of them are gonna suffer. Uh, men that are very diligent and consistent with their exercise program, probably 80% of them are gonna do much better than they thought they would. I've truly had men who uh, have embarked upon testosterone deprivation and initiated a very rigorous exercise program and have come back to me six months later and say, I feel better than when I wasn't taking treatment because of their consistency of fitness. And this has happened a number of times. So it is, uh, it's very responsive to how consistent you are with fitness training. Um, there are uh, lucky, blessed, kissed by angel people that uh, won't do exercise and embark upon testosterone deprivation and they, and they do well. And uh, the, the side effects are very modest, but uh, that's a minority of men. So in this video, we talked about glycinate prostate cancer that is localized and has not metastasized. And we talked about hormone therapy. But I think the th number one thing that I think of when it comes to hormone therapy is how important it is to know about the side effects ahead of time. You wanna know the duration, you wanna know how your PSA needs to act, but the side effects are very important because there's a lot of little details that I find oftentimes men are not being told ahead of time. In fact, I've talked to many men where they were just told, hey, the best option for is hormone therapy, they're injected, and then they're in this completely different world they didn't know was going to happen. They have a loss of interest in sexual activity, maybe they have gynecomastia and they're going breast, and nobody told them that they could take a pill or get radiation to their nipples in order to have this alleviated beforehand, and they're just put into this completely different world of symptoms and issues that they didn't know about. So please, do your research. If you are going to choose hormone therapy, you wanna think about your quality of life and you wanna think about your priorities when you're choosing these treatments. And if you are going to choose hormone therapy, take that list of side effects to your doctors and say, okay, if I experience this side effect, what are my options? And what is the game plan for dealing with it should it come up? Now, if you need more information about hormone therapy, about the side effects, the duration, or anything that we talked about in this video, you can contact our helpline at pcri.org forward slash helpline. A lot of our helpline facilitators have been on hormone therapy, and they can not only tell you about their experiences, but help guide you through the process of speaking with your medical team. All of these videos that PCRI creates are really just to build up your education and to empower you so that you can have a shared decision-making, you know, focus and process with with your medical team and your doctors are you know so important to this process but so are you and your quality of life and what matters to you so please make sure you're taking care of your mental health you're getting the support you need you're talking to somebody about this our helpline is a great way to do that but really get other people involved in this because if you are going to embark upon hormone therapy you want to make sure you have the support throughout that process now, thank you so much for watching this video. We have a lot of other videos describing hormone therapy side effects and different videos that Dr. Schultz has done on this topic. So you can go ahead and search our YouTube channel. I'll go ahead and create a playlist that you can see on our channel site. But please remember, most of all, that you're not alone. You're so important. And I hope you have a great week.